writing the book is an example of the process or story or narrative of creati creativity that I was exploring in the book. In other words, there are all sorts of ways in which I tried to write the book and couldn't. Um, there were hidden constraints on writing a book about creativity in art and science that I didn't realize were there until I started exploring the territory. So uh, the book doesn't have chapters on scientific creativity and artistic creativity. Um, that's not quite true, but I'll tell you how it works. It, so it has an introduction that's me, that's me saying, What's going on here? Um, people think that there's no room for, for creativity within, within science, but if you look at the, the case in point, what people have actually said, you find there's plenty. What's happened in history? It's something to do with the fragmentation of our disciplines. We're going to have to do something about that. So off we set. Then I do have um, a chapter on stories that scientists say about, about uh, to tell about their creativity. And then the penny begins to drop um, that there are these three worlds of creativity. The, the, uh, the visual, in which art and visual metaphor in science exist, the textual where poetry and novels and experimental science and um, uh, Goethe and Wordsworth and um, the early romantics. And, um, and then there's the abstract world where maths and music lie. What I've discovered, of course, given that uh, I need to do deep detailed work as well. I mean, just having a book full of these generalities I'm spouting at you now would be an immensely dull read. Um, and it would also be un indefensible. So I've actually done some very deep dives as well as some metacognitive sort of overview stuff. The reason that the visual metaphor is so useful in itself for creativity is that most of what we see we project. Our visual, our visual field is mostly invented, it's not received. And so the ancients who thought that visual, the vision was rays being projected out of the eye were kind of, from the point of optics, wrong, but the point of view of psychology, correct. So, so creative, creative innovation is there in visual, that, that's the visual chapter. The um, textual chapter takes a comparison between Henry James' art of the novel and the physiologist William Beveridge's Art of Scientific Investigation, which is a very little red book from the early 1950s about the creative process in science, also visits the wonderful mathematician Henri Poincaré, who talks about this deeply at the end of the 19th century, and looks at how Wordsworth's hope that poetry and science would, uh, uh, would come to be married one day, and the way that Goethe and Humboldt, these pairs of scientists and artists, were operating at the early Romantic period, saw a future in which their hopes might flourish, but another future in which all might shatter. And then we follow the future that happened, which is the future in which all becomes shattered and divisive. And then the, 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 uh, the music and mathematics chapter, well, I talk about my favorite mathematics and my favorite music. So as far as I'm concerned, there are composers and then there's Schumann. <laughs> I'm a bit alone in that, but Robert Schumann is, as far as I'm concerned, the great, the great 19th century genius. Um, he, he's, he, he didn't just write new music, he innovated entire genres. He invents the piano quintet. He, he also invents the, the, uh, the concerto quartet. So he writes, as far as I'm concerned, the best romantic piece ever written, the concert took for four horns and orchestra. So I'm going around in the literature trying to find, I need a musical analysis for the concert for Four Horns and Orchestra. It's a fantastic piece and I want to write about its structure. It's in the, it doesn't exist. It's not there. So uh, Julian Horton, my, my colleague in, in, in Durham, says, well, I'm, um, I'm professor of, of, uh, of music. He says, well, I'm involved in a, in a project on, on 19th century symphonic romantic repertoire. Why don't we sit down and write the analysis together? It's mostly him. So we'll hear him. I just say what it's like to be an amateur horn player playing this thing. Um, so you will find uh, the first ever printed, um, published analysis for the concert for horns and orchestra in, in that chapter, alongside a no holds barred discussion of my favourite mathematical physics theorem, which is it's called the fluctuation dissipation theorem, and it connects two apparently disconnected scientific phenomena. If you look closely under a microscope at a, at a little bead hanging there in the fluid, you look closely, and Robert Brown, the botanist. Um, famously recorded observations on this at uh, the early 19th century. You'll see it jiggling around all the time. It slowly diffuses. It's called Brownian motion. And it's, it's, it's because of heat. It's because, it's because of the chaotic fluctuation of the molecule, molecular fluid it's suspended in. Or you can uh, put some charge on it in an electric field. You can drag the 
the fluid, drag the particle through the fluid. You might imagine that the distance it diffuses in the world, if left to its own devices, and the speed with which it will follow a drag force are entirely unrelated phenomena. They're not. They're two halves of the same coin. The first is fluctuation, the second is dissipation. And what is more, that is a general coinage that exists in the world, all worlds, of, uh, of heat and, and thermal agitation, from what's going on in our cells now to electrical circuits, um, everything. And it's a beautiful theorem because it connects two apparently different worlds in a mathematical structure that itself connects with the physical world. Now, in both the music and the mathematics, there is, of course, some materiality, and that's symbolic. And I've wanted, I've printed without apology, equations and musical notation in this chapter, partly to illustrate, and it can be just for artistic impression. So if you don't read mathematics or don't read music, don't worry. Enjoy looking at the symbols with which these creative people interact as they innovate and, and create. Then having done that, that's the core of the book, um, I then have to handle one topic which emerged as a surprise for me, which was this entanglement of the emotional and the cognitive, or the affective and, and, and cognitive. This is when I need to have recourse to the medieval philosophy, because no one really has thought about this as deeply as they did. Robert Grosseteste, for example, right here in Oxford, a great Oxford man of the early 13th century, taught, taught the Oxford Franciscans, wrote a, on his manual for the seven liberal arts, why we do learning at all, why we have disciplines. He had these two words, affectus and aspectus. The affect, they almost emotion and thought, but they don't quite align. They're a bit mixed between those two categories now. But he describes how all study brings an in, the emotions of desire, frustration and joy alongside the problem solving and the cognitive and the conceptual. David Hume takes this up, and he's not often noticed to have done this, but this... Um, uh, and then honest confessions by scientists and, and artists today will recognise this. So we've dealt with that, and then that allows us to reflect on the material we've already read. And then finally, the last chapter is called The End of Creation, and it's a pun. <laughs> it's the end of the book, finally, at last. But it's also the end as in the sense of purpose. It's why we do this, why it is part of our human psyche is to be creative. Um, there's some philosophy here too, not so much the medieval philosophy, although there's a little bit, as you can imagine, we draw on Anselm as a matter of fact. Um, the 20th century phenomenologists, so Heidegger, Hannah Arendt, Sartre, have things to say. Sartre said, for example, the root purpose for art, of art, is to reflect nature as if it were a product of human imagination. George Steiner, literary scholar, says that the art, only through art, um, can we uh, reconcile ourselves, bring into some measure of commensurability the sheer inhuman otherness of matter. Um, Hannah Arendt talks about the, 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 the gap between the human and the, and the non-human. So this is the 20th century experience of the need to reconcile us to the world. This is actually strong resonance with my earlier book, The um, Faith and Wisdom in Science, which was all about how science does that. Uh, but it also calls on, on the discipline of theology. And I've often said that whether you're, you know, whether you're believer or religious believer or not, um, one should, in even the most secular of university contexts, make sure you have uh, theologians. You make your a department of theology, religious studies, because among the humanities, that is the discipline which has maintained the critical toolkit to handle teleology or purpose. Other subjects have kind of got a bit embarrassed about purpose. But, but purpose is important to all human endeavour, particularly to recreate to a purpose. So I um, uh, say something about, about purpose and return to my favourite um, piece of ancient literature, which is a, a poem that's actually found itself into the Old Testament. Um, it's called the Book of Job. And the Book of Job, for me, is the most imaginative, creative piece of prose um, and poetry too, um, and science, because it asks questions about, the, about nature in a, a, whole of ancient, uh, a whole of ancient literature corpus. Um, and interestingly, there isn't a serious, there are very few serious philosophers who ha who've thought about philosophy and written about imagination 
and our human predicament who have not commented upon the book of Job. So that's where we finish.